We ready? It's 11 11, make a wish. Mine is that everyone be quiet. See, wishes do come true on Earth Day. Uh, this is what happens. It's Earth Day. Go plant a tree, buy an organic apple, uh, do something nice for Mother Earth. All right? Uh, you should do that every day, by the way. It's like being nice to your mom. Uh, don't just be nice to your mom on Mother's Day. Be nice to your mom all the time. In case you don't believe me, uh, come, come, come see me with your mom at graduation, and I'll, I'll, you know, we'll have a discussion about this. Uh, so for those of you graduating, you're almost at the finish line. For those of you not graduating, you're, you're, you're not almost at the finish line, but you're getting closer. Uh, we are three lectures away from being true economists certified. Uh, you got to cross the final, but you know, that's minor details. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to finish today uh, asymmetric information. We are all going to do, since it's Earth Day, we're going to talk about the market failure of all market failures, externalities. I mean, this stuff is beautiful, right? A lecture on externalities on Earth Day. I woke up this morning, I was happy. Uh, I'm still happy, not because it's Earth Day, but because I get to talk about my favorite market failure uh, on Earth Day. I am a terrible, terrible nerd. Uh, but you know what? It's not so bad. OK, so just to be sure where we are, uh, I know these last time things take up time, but I, know, I, I think I know partially how your brains function. Unless I slowly bring you back and ground you where we were, you're completely lost for the rest of the lecture. So I know we're wasting three minutes at the beginning of each lecture on this, but I think that sort of like brings us back up to speed. So uh, in your evaluations later on, you can tell me whether these, these slides here are useless or not in the beginning of class. I kind of like them, but you don't have to. All right, price discrimination comes in three flavors, first order, second order, third order. Perfect price discrimination is where the firm can tell exactly what your marginal willingness to pay for something is, and it charges you exactly that. So everybody pays a different price. Their reservation price or maximum willingness to pay for a certain good. What that means, the firm captures all consumer surplus. We produce at the efficient output level, but there's no consumer surplus, there's only producer surplus. So this is the ultimate efficient yet non equitable outcome. Quantity price discrimination is the buy one get one 50% off setting where a, a firm that can set price, a monopolist that can set price, charges a high price for the first couple of units, therefore capturing a whole bunch of consumer surplus for those first units, and then charges a lower price for the second number of units, thereby increasing output beyond where a single price monopolist would charge and capturing additional consumer surplus there too. Uh, so this is a nice setting, it's inefficient, uh, but in some settings it may be from a welfare point of view actually be better uh, than single price monopoly. Uh, the third one is multi-market or third order price discrimination. This is where a single firm operates in multiple markets. The easiest way to think about it, you sell stuff in San Francisco and you sell stuff in London and you can charge a different price in each place. How are you going to act in each market? The answer is, of course, like a profit maximizing firm, if you're the only firm selling a good in a market, you act like a monopolist. So this firm acts like a monopolist in each market. Uh, the welfare implications here aren't quite clear. Is this worse than uh, this monopolist setting the same price in both markets or different price in both markets? It gets tricky here. So that was price discrimination. Then we started talking about asymmetric information, the two types of... Uh, Things we talked about in this particular section were adverse selection. So if you offer an you know, uh, actuarially fair life insurance to people, uh, the people who will pick it up are people who are more sick, more likely to die before the, the uh, term of the insurance policy is up. So there's an unobservable characteristic of individuals that the insurer doesn't observe that will ruin the sort of random selection notion that the insurer has, that people sort of randomly select, a representative sample of the population selects into buying the insurance plan when what you're getting is uh, sick and old people. Moral hazard is slightly different. There's a behavior, a response, a change in behavior due to some type of uh, action here. Uh, so the thing I'm thinking of is if all of a sudden you provide auto insurance or somebody buys auto insurance, uh, they may all of a sudden drive more recklessly, change their behavior uh, since they now have auto insurance, right? Uh, if I rent a car and I buy the full collision, full damage, full everything waiver, so my son loves Mustangs, uh, we rented a Mustang, maybe I shouldn't talk about this on Earth Day, uh, we put the good car seat in the back and we, we did donuts, it was awesome. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't do that in my own car, right? I would only do that in a rental car. I hope Hertz ain't listening. Uh, we returned it nice and... Uh, was sniffing a couple of uh, a centimeter of tire. But, no, let's not talk about that. Uh, but you see what I'm saying, right? Uh, that's the, the two issues we're talking about. But the big thing that I claimed and didn't really show you is if you have a market uh, where there are good and bad Honda Civics, right? So they're all red, they all have four wheels, they all look nice, but there are some that are of higher quality than others, right? Some are lemons and some aren't, but you can't tell from the outside whether something is a lemon or it isn't. What I claimed is that this asymmetric information problem, where only the seller observes whether a car is of high quality or not, may make the market for high quality cars disappear. So that I still have to show you. So let's do that. Here we go. So. Again, just to be clear, when I heard, you know, when I heard about the lemons model for the first time, it took me a long time to figure out that we weren't talking about citrus. All right, we're talking about low-quality vehicles. Uh, it's American uh, for crappy car. So buyers in the market for lemons. This is you. Uh, you graduate. Your family gives you uh, three thousand dollars if you're lucky to go buy a car, and you have to go buy a car so you can get to your, you know, Teach for America job or whatever amazing thing you're going to do next. Uh, so you're looking for a used car. Uh, this example was written a long time ago because you can't really buy a car for $1,000 anymore. Uh, but the notion here is that the buyers are willing to pay $1,000 for a low-quality car, but you're willing to pay more for a high-quality car. So both are Honda Civics, but one you know is going to last for another 100,000 miles. The other one's just going to give you terrible problems over the next 100,000 miles. So you're willing to pay more for a good car than for a bad car. All right, that's the demand side of that market. How about the supply side? So let's say there are owners of cars. Uh, there are 2,000 cars in the market where owners are willing to sell their cars. There's 1,000 lemons, 1,000 crappy cars, and 1,000 good-use cars. So 1,000 of each type. Right? Buyers are willing to pay 1000 for the lemons and 2000 for the good use cars. Now, at what price are the owners of these cars willing to sell their cars? I'm going to, and I'm just making up these numbers. All right? So the owners of the crappy cars, if they get anything less than $750, they're not willing to sell. So if you walk in and you say, I'll give you $500 for your lemon, the owner says, I'll just use it myself. You have to give me at least $750. For the good cars, the reservation price is, uh, let's start with $1250, and then I'll show you what happens if the reservation price is actually higher. So in the first example I'm going to use here, the reservation price for good cars is $1250. So Max, this seems like a pretty straightforward uh, setup. Max is talking to himself again. Great. Uh, but the point here is we've got two types of cars. Buyers are willing to pay more for better cars. That's a reasonable setup. Sellers uh, have cars of each type. They're willing to accept less money for the car of lower quality than for the car of, of higher quality. I think it's a pretty reasonable setup that we see in the real world. Okay. So what I'm going to show you 
is since buyers cannot observe, we're going to rule out Carfax and mechanics and things like that, and then talk about why mechanics and Carfax are important, uh, but we're going to rule that out. I'm going to argue that because buyers cannot observe whether a car is a lemon or not, all cars are going to sell at $1,500, meaning uh, that the sellers of good cars do worse right, than the sellers of bad cars. Right? So there's a subsidy essentially going from the sellers of the good cars to the sellers of lemons. Uh, OK, let's do this first part first, and then we'll do the second part second. Let's draw the picture, because by now it's getting a little bit confusing. So here we go. On the left here, market for lemons. And this here is the market for good cars. For some reason, this thing is not writing really nicely. So lemons, crappy cars, good cars, right here. Uh, on the y-axis, we have price. On the x-axis, we have lemons. For those of you who've seen cars, too, this is, of course, very important, uh, good cars. OK, so what's the setup here? Right? Uh, what's the willingness uh, to accept of the sellers in the market for lemons. So if you go back to the slides that you hopefully have this time, because I uploaded them on time, uh, lemons sellers are willing to accept $750. So let's say $750 is, oh, I need to get to $2,000. So let's say it's this here. I am shaking today. I don't know why. All right, $750. There's 1,000 lemons. So there's 1,000 lemons uh, being sold at a price less than 750, zero are sold. At a price higher than 750, all lemons are sold. Right? So this is a none or all. We could do the same example with upward sloping supply curves, but it just makes it harder. All right? So this here is the supply for lemons. How about the supply for good cars? Well, the supply for good cars, we said the reservation price initially was 1250. Okay? So here I have 1250. And after the price is higher than 1250, if consumers are willing to pay more than $1,250, all 1,000 good cars get sold too. So let's just make this clear here. This is 1,000 good cars. So this is the supply of good cars. Great. So this looks pretty good. We've got the supply side figured out. So in the market for lemons, if less than 750 is offered, nothing gets sold. If more than 750 is offered, all 1,000 gets sold. In the market for good cars, if less than 1250 is offered, nothing gets sold. If more than 1250 is offered, uh, all 1,000 cars get sold. All right. Now let's go back quickly and just look at what the demand side looks like. All right. So consumers are willing to pay 1,000 for a lemon and 2,000 for a good used car. So if we can somehow figure out, break this informational asymmetry, Right? Uh, where you do a uh, lie detector test. Uh, so you put the lie detector on the car salesman, and you say, is this car a lemon? And they would say, yes. And if they lie, you know that they're lying. And if they don't lie, you know that they're telling the truth. Right? If you can somehow tell whether something's a lemon or not, then this informational asymmetry disappears, and you can actually tell lemons from not lemons. So what this means is that demand for lemons is where people are willing to pay $1,000 for the lemons. So this is, hold on, 750, so 1,000's got to be here. So this is the demand for lemons. And people are willing to pay 2,000 for the good cars. Demand for good cars. That means the equilibrium price in the market for lemons is going to be 1,000. And the equilibrium price in the market for good cars is going to be 2,000. That's going to be the efficient outcome here. Right? But this is the perfect information outcome. How do you think the Audi dealer would feel if you walk up with a lie detector test and you say, can you, can you take off your nice uh, tailored suit jacket? I'm going to need to like, strap this thing around your chest and your arm. And do you mind if I take your blood pressure and ask you some verifying questions? Uh, this is not how we do business. right? So you walk onto the used, uh, used dealer lot, and you're not sure. If you are unsure about whether a car is good or not, if the only thing you know is that about half the cars are good and half the cars are bad, so you think your subjective probability of getting a lemon is about 50-50. We could change those weights any way we want to, but the math is just easier with 50-50. How much would you be willing to pay for a car? So the chance is 50-50. 1,500, right? So, so the weighted average between the two prices. We could make arguments that go differently, all right? But for now, I'm going to tell you a story uh, about how, well, you're willing to pay 2,000 for the good car, 1,000 for the bad car. You're unsure which, whether you're getting a good car or a bad car, so what you're going to do is you're going to pay the average value between your two willingness to pay for the two. So your willingness to pay is 1,500 bucks. So let's draw that in here. We having fun? Yeah. This is a complicated picture. Sorry, I keep on spying on my notes. So this here is my 1500 bucks. Can you read that? Yep. This is the D star. So the equilibrium, when you're uncertain about whether a car is good or not, and you're doing your 50-50 calculation where you're just paying the, the weighted average, or the average here because it's 50-50, of the two prices, what's the equilibrium here? Do all lemons get sold? Don't, don't guess, all right? Guessing in economics almost always leads to the wrong answer. So think about lemons, all right? You're now all of a sudden willing to pay 1500 bucks for any Honda Civic. What's the reservation price of the people selling lemons? So you're stepping up there. You're selling a lemon for 1500 instead of 70, 750. You know what that dealer is going to do, or the sellers of lemons? They're going to do a little happy dance. They're going to go like this. Yes, asymmetric information is my friend. So they're taking home, instead of the $1,000 here, they're going to take home 1500 bucks for their 1,000 lemons. 500 times 1,000. I think you can do that in your head. In this low price market here, where cars sell at like $1,000, which doesn't really exist, it's $500,000. We're talking about uh, other used cars in the real world that started sort of 10,000. This can go into the millions, millions if you look nationally into the billions of dollars, right? So these guys here, the lemon sellers, really like it. What about these sellers of good cars? Before the equilibrium was, they sold their good cars at $2,000. Now they sell it at how much? $1,500. Are they still well willing to sell the good cars at $1,500? Yes, right? What's their reservation price? 
1250 right here right there is a section where the supply curve intersects the new demand here 1250 but now uh, so the equilibrium price being 1500 which is above the reservation price of 1250 but that's lower than two thousand dollars right that's going to cut into the uh, brioni suit budget of the audi dealer uh, for sure so what the notion here is you are taking this amount of profits here for our online customers uh, you're taking essentially this area right here and you are donating it to the sellers of used cars uh, crappy cars, right? So this is what I meant by there's a subsidy here that essentially goes from the sellers of good cars to the sellers of bad cars. And this simply comes from our inability to tell the type of car, high quality versus low quality. Now, Max, when you walked out here all confident in your certainly not Brioni jacket, right? Uh, definitely not. As far away from it. This is a low quality jacket, uh, for sure. Uh, you said this problem may be so bad that it may actually drive sales of high quality vehicles uh, completely out of the, the market, right? No good vehicles will be sold anymore. Well, let's look back at the setup, right? Here, what I said is the reservation price of uh, people who are selling good quality cars is 1250. Now, in this uncertainty setting here, they're getting 1500 bucks, which is higher than 1250. So what if the reservation price wasn't 1250? What if the reservation price, like I indicated in the setup of the problem, is higher at 1750, right? What if the reservation price is here? Now, if my reservation price is 1750 and this information constrained price, right, where we have this issue that we can't tell what type it is, the equilibrium price here is 1500 bucks, right? People will walk onto the lot saying, I'm willing to pay 1500 bucks for a Honda Civic of unknown type, uh, but the reservation price of the good type people is 1750, so none of the good quality vehicles will sell. What does that mean? What's the only type of vehicle left in the market? Lemons. Is that a desirable outcome? No, right? When you go buy your first used car, you'd like to at least get a shot at getting a, a non lemon uh, in, the, in, the car, uh, in the market. So this to me, is an example of applying the demand and supply model in a really simple fashion that provides us with an insight about what happens in actual markets that to me is just fascinating. So the story behind this, uh, this paper here was that when George Akerlof arrived on campus a few years ago, many years ago, uh, he went for lunch. This is folklore, all right, but it's good. So he went for lunch with uh, Tom Rothenberg at the time, who's a very distinguished econometrician in the economics department here. And uh, you know, young assistant professors, they talk to the senior guys in the department, what should I be working on? And you know, while they're eating their soup, uh, George tells Tom you know, some stories about papers he's thinking of. And on the way back to Evans, Tom says, you know what? That lemons thing sounds interesting. I would work on that. Nobel Prize for this paper, right? It's elegant, it's simple, it's beautiful, it's got nice testable predictions, it's hugely policy relevant, talks about huge welfare transfers from one side of the market to the other. Uh, it's a really, really nice, elegant uh, paper, and it's got a cool title, The Market for Lemons. Come on, uh, I don't have cool, cool titles like that. So how do you limit lemons? Uh, you try, you know, there's, there's laws that try and, and, and prevent this opportunity-seeking type uh, behavior uh, where you try and minimize the number of low-quality cars that actually enter the market. Uh, for example, Germany has very, very strict testing requirements for what kind of types of cars that you actually get to register. So you have to go every year or every two years and get a detailed technical checkup of your vehicle, vehicle to make sure it's, uh, it's okay. Uh, in the U.S., that's not necessarily the case, but, you know, there are these many, many different laws that, that try and get at that. Uh, you can screen, right, where you actually get to take the... Uh, take the vehicle uh, for a, a test drive, right? This is what we do. You don't just go look at our cars standing there and say, I'll take that one. Uh, you say, hand me the keys. I'm going to drive it around the block, do a couple of donuts, even though in a Honda Civic, that's tough to do. Uh, but you try and figure out whether the car actually operates as advertised and everything works. There's third-party comparisons. Consumer Reports, for example, does it for you. What are the good used cars? What are the bad used cars? Uh, a colleague of mine at UCSD writes these papers about you know, quality of, of used vehicles and, 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 and over time. So you get lots and lots of these third-party comparisons. Those of you who subscribe to Car and Driver, you know, these magazines are full of, of third-party uh, comparisons. Uh, you can uh, try and come up with standards and certificates, right, where you actually try and measure the quality of a, of a particular good. I don't know if any of you have bought a house before. I only bought one a couple of years ago. Talk about a, a process with huge transaction costs and really unobservable quality differences across houses, right? You don't know what's in the, vault, in the walls in terms of insulation. You don't know what the wiring, what quality of wiring there is in the house. You don't know how good the foundation is and so on. So there are certain standards where, uh, you know, just by opening a wall and looking at whether it's insulated or not, you can, can't actually tell how good the insulation quality is. So there are certain certificates where it'll say these walls or this type of insulation has a certain R value. It's a standardized measure that's printed on something that'll tell you the quality of the, the thing you're looking at. Uh, there's certification where you get certification authorities or, you know, in the sense of cars, uh, you can take it to certain organizations and they will uh, actually give you a certificate that a certain product meets a certain standard level. Uh, in cars, you see this all the time now, right? It's gotten so far that if you go to Auto Trader and when you search for a used car, you can do private party searches, dealer searches, or dealer cert certified searches, where a certified used Audi costs a little bit more, but they guarantee that it meets a certain minimum level of quality, and they ensure that by giving you a 60,000 mile warranty. I'm sorry I keep on talking about Audi. I'm just responding to BMWs, Mercedes, and Porsches. Uh, none of which I drive, but that's, it's Earth Day. Okay. Uh, there are, uh, you know, these, these sort of third-party uh, certifications. It, it sort of goes from certification and these guarantees and warranties. Those are often used jointly, right? It's certified, plus we provide a guarantee.